Good evening and welcome to Legal Tech Live episode 55. Tonight I am joined by Casey Rose Shevin, CEO and co-founder of Divorceify. And Divorceify, and there's a couple of things here. I'm going to read from this one because I think this is really interesting. This is your crunch base. And I'm wondering if anything's changed since you did this, but let me read a little bit here from crunch base. The three female attorneys behind Divorceify are innovating the way consumers approach divorce with your, in your trademarked divorce GPS, an unbiased divorce orientation and needs assessment powered by predictive technology. Americans spend over $30 billion each year on divorce legal fees. And each of the 2 million people getting divorced has a unique set of problems necessitating a unique solution. After completing a short guided intake, clients receive a customized roadmap predicting their normal or their optimal divorce process and matching them to professionals in Divorceify's national network that they can hire. That's a pretty great summary of it. Yeah, it, that does it. That is, is that it? So, first of all, thank you, Casey, for being here tonight, and we really appreciate it. Can you tell us how you got started? Absolutely. From your, your own journey before, before we get to the divorce file. Got it. Okay. So, I became a family law attorney because family is the most important thing in my life. And I really like that in family law, you get the opportunity to be a true counselor, like when you really think of lawyers as true counselors. So divorce is not just a legal problem. It's also a financial problem and an emotional problem. And it really takes someone who has, um, you know, emotional intelligence and empathy and a big picture view of the problem. So to really guide someone through it efficiently. So I really liked family law because I got to really use all of those sides of being a true counselor. So when I started in family law, something that I noticed is that divorce clients, when they come to an initial consult with a divorce attorney, they typically have found them like by chance. Either they stumbled across them on the internet or they got referred to them by a friend who got divorced or maybe a distant cousin oftentimes they haven't even spoken to their spouse about wanting a divorce yet. So it's really raw. And what a divorce attorney, that's their opportunity to sell themselves to the client, right? Mm -hmm. You should hire me for your divorce and introduce themselves the way they practice um, and hear about the client's problems and then walk the client through what their needs are. But what the client doesn't realize is that every divorce attorney has a different set of skills. Some people are great in front of judges and doing that sword and shield act for their client when the spouse is trying to hide something or you know, has you know, really done some sort of horrible transgression in the marriage. But and there's also attorneys who are great at settling things out of court, of keeping angry parties' temperatures down. And sometimes that's what you need. So there's really a range of services in divorce. And when you're in an attorney's office for an initial consultation, you're just getting sold on that attorney's service. You're not hearing about the range of options out there. So I realized after several years in litigation, I'm a better mediator than I am a litigator. Mm -hmm. I was always leaning on my clients to settle and be reasonable and compromise. And that worked for some people, but other people were like, wait, I want you to go in and fight for me. And you know, I don't care what it costs. I want to get them. And there's a lawyer for that client. And it wasn't me. Right. So I left and founded my own practice. I called it family centered law and mediation. And some of the older practitioners that I worked with, the more experienced practitioners that I worked with were told me, you know, you're really niching yourself too much by speaking only to one type of client. You'll, you're too young to have your own practice. You won't be successful. And I have to tell you, my first client found me on LinkedIn my literally two days before I opened my doors because they had typed in family friendly divorce attorney, New York city. And I was the only one talking about how to have a family friendly divorce. So that was a really big light bulb moment for me that distinguishing what you're good at as a family law professional really brings the clients who want your specific service to you. That's when you can do your best work. And then of course people refer their friends to you, right? Who want the similar type of service. So my practice was a success and I met lots of different clients who 
had defer like defaulted to mediation after already trying litigation, spending too much money on it, getting frustrated with the process, hearing about mediation as an alternative, coming to me after spending $30,000, and then spending a lot less than that to just resolve their divorce. So around that time, I started looking for other companies that were doing innovative things. In the and you, So you had practiced combined for about how long before you- At that point, I was practicing for, I think, about like four or five years. Okay. And I met Sonia. And Sonia is my co-founder. She was based in Boston at the time, Sonia Kuralt. She's also a divorce attorney. She had also left litigation because she had just recently had her own divorce, had seen divorce from the client's perspective, realized that you need so much more than just legal help. And that even though she knew the law and thought she could handle her own divorce, <laughs> you know, she thought, oh, actually, that's totally false. My judgment's completely clouded by emotions and financial stress, and I need help. So, you know, both of us met each other when we were each founding our own practice. She was starting a coaching service. I was starting family-centered law and mediation. And we both realized that there was this gap for clients that was an unbiased orientation service that would educate them as to the range of options, the different types of practitioners that are out there, not just legal help, but also financial, um, financial help, emotional help, parenting coordination help, um, mortgage help, actually. So you're They're looking for a holistic approach. Right. So we developed a, what we call Divorce GPS. So Divorce GPS, uh, you take a natural language quiz as a client. It's like a tree. So it's either like five to 10 minutes, ranging on the complexity of like your circumstances. And at the end, it guides you through the various process options that are out there. So we focus on litigation, mm -hmm. which is, of course, you're in front of a judge, you're at court, that's the most costly way to get divorced. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is negotiating through attorneys. So you don't have to talk to your spouse, but you each hire a lawyer and you tell them we don't want to go to court, we just want you guys to work it out. Next one down is what we call the kitchen table, the, or sorry, the mediation. So that's like you hire a neutral third party who might be a lawyer or not, and that person guides the couple to an agreement. And the next step down is the kitchen table divorce, where you try to, try to work it out together, and then maybe you hire a lawyer just to write up your agreement. And the next step down is what we call do-it-yourself divorce, which is really you can reach an agreement and then use an online company to process your forms and you can really go to court and file it yourself and you've done the whole thing yourself. So there's five different levels and we diagnose for somebody which one we think is the best fit for them. It's usually two to three options and then we highlight the pros and cons of each for them and why we gave those, them the, those options. And then in their next tab over on their roadmap as we call it, they have their matched professionals. So we okay. assess, does this person need more than legal help? Okay. So they get asked a question along the way, is the stress of your divorce interfering with your day-to-day -day functioning, for example? Mm -hmm. If they say yes, we're going to probably recommend a coach or a therapist to them. If they say, you know, I might actually want to try to work on my marriage, I'm not even sure yet if I want to get a divorce, we'll not only recommend a therapist, we're also going to rec someone who, recommend someone who does discernment counseling, which is a type of therapy to figure out whether you want to get a divorce. So, I didn't even know there was that kind of therapy. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have um, a joint asset like real estate, we're going to say you probably want to see a mortgage broker if you want to keep that house because you're going to need to refinance. And there are mortgage brokers who um, actually have special training on how to help divorcing people get qualified for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of specificity there. And we don't expect clients to know all of that on the day one of deciding they want to get a divorce. So we guide them through the simple language intake. And then at the end, we say to them, these are the types of professionals you might want to hire. And we look in our national network for people who are in their geographic area who they might want to hire. And we're looking at um, the hard, we're looking at soft traits as well as hard things. So we look at like their billable rate. Can they afford this person? But we also look at soft skills, like what type of an attorney do they want to hire? Do they want someone who takes a lot of time to explain concepts directly to clients? Or do they want someone who's like really fast and efficient? It really, you know, we have clients tell us what they want. Interesting. So that's good. So it's customer service oriented service, uh, customer experience oriented, I guess. Uh, 
I, I would be all about the efficiency and I don't want to talk to them on the phone. I want them to text me, I, you know, those kind mm -hmm. of specific or uh, and, and please don't ever email. Yeah, we asked, do you want to work with them virtually or in person? Like some people actually right. prefer virtual meetings. They yeah. would rather do it like this from their office than go right. downtown to meet their lawyer. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely right. So once they've been through this early analysis of what they need in the particular style of divorce that they need, what's the next step for, for a user? So the next step is they can actually click through to those professionals and they can go ahead and contact them right through their Divorceify profile. There also is a nice little part of their roadmap that actually lays out a documents checklist. So it gets them started. So some people have this like anxious energy at the beginning and they just like want to know what the to-do list is and get started right away. And there actually is a very long to-do list when you're getting divorced of documents you need to collect, information you need to gather. And based on what information they give us in their intake, we populate a list of documents they can start gathering. And we say, if you bring these to your initial consultation with an attorney, you're gonna really make a lot of use of that first billable hour. Right, which is, uh, it, which is great. That's what people wanna hear, you know, mm -hmm. right? because that first hour is gonna be expensive and there's gonna be more to come. So mm -hmm. uh, once again, our guest tonight is Casey Rose Shevin with Divorceify. If you have any questions, in the legal tech community on Facebook, please ask, and we will ask them live here. We have a few people watching, so please ask questions. And Casey, I want you, I, when I'm looking over here, I'm not ignoring you. There's another monitor, so. Nice, two monitor life, I'm familiar with that. Multi, no, not two, <laughs> there's multi. There's nice. more, than, more than two. Um, so then you ask them to, uh, you, you submit, all this information and you with them what you direct the user to the appropriate lawyer based on all right. their answers and right so um we actually only recommend professionals that in our network have been vetted personally by us so anybody who is a divorce professional who falls into one of like i think we have 10 categories of professionals they fall into that category they can go online populate a profile and it'll be published in our website on our website within 24 hours we're like checking to make sure it's a live human who's not a bot you know right. but if they want us to recommend them to a client through divorce gps then they need to apply to be vetted. And what vetting is, is we check their credentials. We make sure they're in good standing with their professional licensing. Um, we really look at online reviews. So, you know, is there anything terribly negative out there that we can find out right away? And then we get on the phone with them and we speak to them in person for 15 to 30 minutes. And, you know, I think in the tech community, like people would say, oh, how are you going to scale that? Right. right. But Honestly, that's a very essential part of the value proposition that we offer clients because what we're looking for is simple things like people who are non-lawyers who give legal advice. Mm -hmm. There are mediators out there who are actually therapists or social workers or even financial professionals. And I think those people are totally qualified to mediate divorce, but they really have to know where the line is between giving legal advice or just providing information. Right. Um, and so we do some hypotheticals. We kind of try to tease that out. We look for that sort of thing. And we also want it to be somebody who we'd be comfortable getting on the phone with ourselves. Right? right. So we're doing that um, level, that first pass with them. And then, of course, if we hear negative feedback from clients who get recommended professionals, that would be something that would make us take a second look at does this person stay in our vetted network? OK. All mm -hmm. right. So then you, yes, please take a sip of water. I any questions, please let us know. Casey Rose Shevin uh, of Divorceify is our guest tonight. What is then the next step once you've handed them over to you, once you've identified the right fit for them, yeah. you put them in touch with uh, yeah, that so lawyer? Yes, for us, a, a choice we made as a company is we didn't want to tell professionals how to do their work. We okay. didn't want to interfere with their process. And part of that is because it's very hard to get attorneys to adopt to anything new. And we really wanted to sort of wade into the waters very slowly. And first of all, we think there are a, such a wide range of ways to get divorced. And people really, there is somebody out there for everyone. There's a, there's a lid for every pot, as they say. There's an attorney for every client. And we didn't want to say there's only one right way to get divorced. And there is a very, the culture, our cultural um, discussion around divorce right now is really all about having an amicable divorce, being a friendly co-parent 
well, of course, that's what my personal practice is centered around and something I really hope for all my clients. It's not realistic for everyone. And we wanted to create a space where every divorcing person felt like they could find what they needed. Um, So we aren't specifying a way or a process to get divorced. We're not taking a percentage of any of our professionals' fees. We're not having them set a specific rate. We're just telling them we want to create price transparency in this marketplace. We want to make it easier for clients to find the type of help they actually need. So when you sign up to be a professional in our network, you have to fill out a pretty detailed profile. You have to publish your billable rate. You have to explain why you charge that. We give a lot of like areas for narratives. And to be honest, the requirement to publish a billable rate does prevent some attorneys from joining our network. Okay. the most controversial thing about what we're doing. Okay. And we think it's an incredibly important thing for clients. Yeah, I would want to know that up front. I need the transparency. What am I looking to spend? Absolutely. And I mean, many professionals, I recently had um, a friend of a friend get uh, emailed me for advice on shopping for an attorney, right? Mm-hmm. She's going for an initial consultation. It's going to cost $400. She comes recommended by a friend, but never really spoken to her. I've just emailed with her. And I don't even, I don't know what her hourly rate is. So, I mean, you're going to pay $400 to meet somebody. You don't know whether or not you're going to like them. You don't know what their hourly rate is. You don't know if it's affordable in the long term. So, and I want to, I want to stop you there because we do have a, a mutual friend has joined us in the Facebook group, uh, Aaron Levine. Um, oh, Aaron. Divorce is giving, she loves the price transparency. She's all for that. She loves divorce GPS, she say. She asks, though, is the referral service automated, which would be an interesting technolo- technological question here. Yeah, so it is. It, it populates within, like, I think it takes two seconds, basically, for them to get populated. So um, we have a fit score behind every, so when our algorithm runs, we look at mm-hmm. every single person in our network for that client. Um, based If we decide they need an attorney, we look at every attorney in the network. If the algorithm decides they need a mental health professional, they look at every mental health professional in the network. Um, every professional gets a fit score that is not published to the client. That's something we might do in a future iteration, actually, that we've been discussing. Um, and we then recommend the top three. If there's nobody in their geographic area, like for example, if they say, I only want to meet with an attorney in person and there isn't an attorney in person in our network that we can match them with, we say, you know, there isn't somebody in your geographic area for us to match you with right now, but we'll let you know when somebody joins our network. So we rerun our algorithms on our roadmaps periodically. And when new professionals join and pop up, the clients get notified that there's been a new match. Okay. And we've done about just under 400 recommendations so far. Okay. And that, that would lead me to the next question. Are you guys New York centered right now or Boston centered? Or, yeah. Because so, I'm sorry, let me, for those who are uh, in Aaron said rad, Cassie. She, yeah, Casey, I'm sorry. Yeah. Rad, Casey. Um, it, this would lead me to the next question about the where you're currently doing this. And I should say for everybody who's watching that I, I know that there's a move inevitable because yeah. we had a discussion beforehand. So I'm not just picking these areas out. Uh, not sure. long. So our network is live and across the country. It's just U.S. Um, right now. We have had in, we have had people ask like from Australia and Canada if we'll open up you know, internationally. And, you know, look, the U S is all we can handle right now. Just yeah. <laughs> for the three of us. Um, and it's a lot, it's a lot. Uh, we have professionals all across the country. We have actually a great professional in North Dakota, uh, Krista Andrews, who is an innovator herself. And, you know, we are finding really the, the people who are coming to us in this first wave of people who have joined us, I find are the people who are out there looking for services like us. It's the innovators in the field, the thought leaders in the field, the people who are progressive, who wanna bring the highest level service to their client from a tech perspective. Um, and so we're attracting a lot of people who are actually very experienced. Our average practitioner has 19 years of experience and charges just under $400 an hour. So. These are experienced and sometimes pretty pricey professionals. Yeah. Um, but there are people who have been in the field long enough to know this is so needed. That's, and, and we should say, because, you know, we have lawyers who watch our show as well, and not just technologists, but 
$400 an hour for somebody with nearly 20 years of experience. Yes, is it pricey? It's pricey to the consumer, but you you get what you pay for in this. I always you? tell my friends, like, it is worth it. Good yeah. legal advice is worth it. It is um, right. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that lawyers are hesitant to publish their rate because they think clients will get sticker shock. And Which is also an understandable position. Totally. Totally. And I think as a field, we have to become more educated about how to explain our rates and justify our value. I think in law school, no one teaches lawyers how to market themselves. And so we, there's really no education about how to explain your fee, how to set your fee, how to choose your fee. You know, I think if you asked a lawyer, why are you X rate per hour? Why are they? Yeah. You know? And I think a lot of lawyers also don't know what the average rate is in their geographic area because right. there's just so little clarity. I mean, right. and family law is dominated by solo practitioners and small practice groups primarily. Yep. So there's even more of a siloed rate. I mean, you see, you know, when you get opposing counsel in a get litigation, you eventually see their retainer letter and you right. see them charging. So you might have an idea of what your peers are charging, but there's not a ton of transparency there. Right, right. And that's important for the user who is looking. And as we know, divorce can be incredibly expensive, uh, yeah. which is why just there's... Want to understand what the rates are and why they are what they are. That's right. People need to know what they're... So, so lawyers have some difficulty explaining the value proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've seen this a lot of times when, when you go to a big law firm right out of law school and they're charging $400 an hour and the client's Luckily, those are different clients oftentimes, but well, you, know, it's you would funny. wonder, what am I paying a first year associate for? Yeah, right. But you know, there are, I, there are some big firms that do family law, have family, like small practice groups within them, and those lawyers charge very high rates. And you know, honestly, they provide a great service to people mm -hmm. who want that level of service, like people who want to have two associates come to their hearing in addition with the, the partner, right? right? Like they're willing to pay for that because they want the show of that. Right. Um, and you know, divorce is highly emotional. Like it's really important to people that their lawyer projects how they're approaching their divorce. Sure, sure. So Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron, Casey, uh, we've got, I've got Aaron over here in the chat and she's throwing- I'm okay me. with being confused with Aaron if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And thank you, Guy DiMartino is here. Thanks for tuning in, Guy. He's a lawyer out of Indiana and in Florida. Um, what, how are you guys monetizing the Divorceify platform? Yeah. Are so, you a referral service? Do the attorneys pay you? Do the, yeah. Does the client pay you? How does that work? So our ultimate goal is to become like a subscription service for professionals. I think the basic level of subscriptions which is what we have live now is free. Eventually we'll introduce higher level of subscriptions that include other services. And one of the things we're working on right now is for example, a booking feature where a client can not only contact a professional, but also book a meeting with them right through their profile, similar to ZocDoc, right? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing to start with, with booking feature would be initial consultations. And the professional can set, you know, the length of the consult, whether it's by phone, whether it's in person, whether it's charged or free. Um, and then we would monetize by charging a very small uh, platform use fee to the client on okay. those transactions. But I think that for clients, for professionals who want to have a booking feature built into their, um, into their profile, that would be a fee, right? So right. right now, everything is live on our website, Divorce GPS, the recommendations, the basic level subscriptions, getting vetted and then being recommended to clients. All of those things are free. That's what we consider the basic level of the marketplace that we're creating is we are efficiently connecting supply to demand and like the next level up is gonna be the booking, um, other features that we have in development as well. But having that free entry level is good for the data that you, you, you need yeah, that data in order exactly. to see, yeah. I mean, also our algorithm is built on a machine learning neural net. So okay. it is gonna get smarter over time and we are gonna retrain it and break that roadmap up into smaller pieces and be able to make even better predictions. Um, and right now there's really no one out there gathering any information on what professionals are charging in divorce, what type of professionals are out there, um, you know, what the services they provide are. And I think that the services in divorce are really, you know, they're really diversifying right now. People are offering flat rate services, unbundled services, and clients should see that there's a variety of options out there now. 
That's right. That's right. Okay. So take me through this, take me through this step. What is, where are you guys at right now? Are you focused on monetization at this point or are you focused on we are focused on customer acquisition. We're focused on growth, basically. Like growth. Customer okay. acquisition. And you know, we're a two-sided marketplace, which is a challenge mm -hmm. for any startup. Right. So we have to be attracting professionals and clients. Um, you know, for us, we are also working right now on, I guess you're the first person I'm telling about publicly, but we're currently working on a premarital counseling service. Okay. Um, we know that millennials are very like increasingly interested in prenups. They're increasingly interested in cohabitation agreements and they want financial advice and emotional and counseling advice on how to have healthy relationships. And so we are developing a product that will create a pipeline for our professionals of people who want those services, but maybe are afraid to say, hey, to, to their uh, fiance, hey, let's go see a divorce attorney about what are the rights and responsibilities of being married, right? Right, that's right. And I want to thank Bernard Nomberg is also joining us, a lawyer out of uh, Alabama. So Bernard and Guy, if you guys have questions, please awesome. ask. Our guest tonight is Casey Rose Shevin of Divorcify and Divorcify.com. We have a few great lawyers in Alabama right now, actually. Oh, do you? Oh, excellent. That's yeah. great. So the subscription bay, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed part of this, I think. The subscription base that will be paid by the client professionals. Professionals. Professional we opinion. want like we want clients to be able to access the information for free. We want right. them to, be able to shop the network for free. Like we basically think of ourselves as you know a hub for divorce information for them. We want to make a one stop shop where they can really access everything that they need. So you know ancillary services like ways to get divorced, um, co parenting apps. Um, right. ways coordinate support payments between families. Those are all things that we're building affiliate relationships with and then building into our resource library. So that for clients, like it's really frictionless to just access all of that. We just want to amplify all those voices. Excellent. Okay. All right. And how do we roll out? Uh, the platform is easily accessible regardless of jurisdiction, huh? As long as as long as you guys have pre vetted the attorneys who are gonna be on the Yeah. Board. So I think when you when you first sign on to divorcify.com and you create an account, you're gonna be asked, are you looking for a divorce help or are you a divorce professional? So divorce professionals who wanna fool around with the road mapping process, and I totally encourage them to do so, just use your personal email account, pretend you're a divorce client and have that experience. Okay. Um, I think it's something that I highly recommend professionals do because they should see the information we're giving. We think it's really rich. We're really proud of it. And we're trying to deliver more prepared clients to professionals. One of the things divorce attorneys really struggle with is the collection rate is actually pretty bad in divorce law. They I think 75% collections is considered like a success. Wow. And that means you're really working one day out of your week totally for free. Wow. And that, it shouldn't be that way. And a big reason that is the case is that there's this big final bill that's supposed to be paid out of the divorce settlement mm -hmm. and then just never gets paid. Mm -hmm. And you're forced to decide whether you want to take your client to collections for that and risk some negative Yelp review or just let it go. And most people decide to just let it go. And they just think of that as the cost of doing business. We want clients to be satisfied with the, the, the service their attorney provided, want to pay that final bill, even if it means making a payment plan with their attorney, and then recommend that attorney to a friend and say they did like an efficient service for me. I know they worked hard for me. I was satisfied with them. And we think part of that is delivering clients to attorneys who can actually afford them. Right. So price Which is all yeah. that intake that you're working on yeah. at the front end. Yes. Okay. What so, can they afford? So we assess in that intake, what can this client actually afford? You know, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. So you're not taking the person who's making 40, you know, $35,000 a year and putting them with somebody, you know, when, when they're looking for a DIY, DIY or the kitchen table divorce yeah. and putting them with somebody who charges $550 right. an hour. Right. It makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, so you're in a growth phase. Are you targeting any areas specifically for attorneys are you going after new york and boston and is, is that how you're going to yeah, urban we do, areas 
we how, do how do you see the growth going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to just like attack the entire U.S. market right. at once, right? So we do have a regional growth strategy. We do often get a little derailed by like someone reaching out to us from somewhere else, like outside of the geographic network we're working on. And somebody like Erin, for example, who we, we see her doing something wonderful. We want to bring her into our network and amplify that voice. So we reached out to her and said like, hey, come join us. So we're going to do that for people that we see out there who are, we think of the connectors in the field. Um, and that's beneficial to us because they then talk about us and they bring other like-minded people in. So yes, we're building out geographically. Like I would say we're focused on New York, New Jersey, you know, this geographic area. Um, but I think that we're very we benefit from bringing on innovators so we're looking for innovators wherever they may land well you heard that here folks you've heard the those of you watching bernard guy uh looks like we've had we've got a few others who are who are coming in tk bam and uh shannon lex uh you've heard it uh, if you're an innovator get in touch with the Borsify. um all right so let's switch Let's switch since I have a female founder here and you jumped on it when we were looking for female founders. Yes. Tell us about some struggles and some successes as a female founder. What are a couple of the struggles that you've had? You know, my advice to other female founders is just, especially people who are like me and my two co-founders who we each have given birth during the development of our product. Really, um, really really plan that out well. I love that. <laughs> really just went for it. <laughs> um, you know, I think that my biggest thing is don't let anybody else say, decide what you have time for or what success for you looks like. You know, there's a lot of pressure in the startup community to grow at a certain rate, to do everything at once. And, you know, we're a small team. There's three of us. We have small kids, you know, we have to support our families. This is like our real life, but that didn't stop us from making this happen, right? Like we, we knew it would take a little longer than we wanted it to. And we just kept pushing. And I'm incredibly proud that my son is going to grow up knowing that his mom did like followed her dream and like brought to life a vision, even when it was really hard. So I'm very proud of that. I'm okay with having to stop my day to pick him up at school, you know, at 5.30, even if it means I do a little pajama work at night after he goes to bed. That's right. just, that's okay with me, you know? So I think for me, a struggle as a female founder has been, you know, when I'm sitting across the table from a VC, I certainly wonder, you know, they see I'm a woman in her mid thirties. They probably know I either am about to have kids or have kids mm -hmm. and they're not going to ask me about it, but I assume there's an assumption there. Right. And what I would say is like, I have some insecurity about that, but I also have a lot of pride in that. I, you know, yes, I'm a mom with a small kid and I still did this. I still did this without any money. We bootstrapped it. We brought it to life. We've made a mar marketplace. We created a market. And if that doesn't prove that we can do what we set out to do, I don't know what will. Excellent. I like that. Okay. And what about some uh, a success? I like that. I think that's really great yeah. and a very positive outlook. Uh, and, and I also, I have to ask because this is the image you painted in my mind now. Are there ever team meetings with like three strollers <laughs> hanging out? In like the, no, yeah. we all have childcare. So okay. we, don't, we don't actually try to work when our kids are in the okay. house. Because I'm like, I uh, gotta come over to my places. <laughs> Yeah. I, I thought that might be kind of, that, that was a picture I was painting like, well, we got to get up, we got to get together. So let's bring all the kids together. Um, so successes other than, than that you followed your dream and you're doing this with, you know, with time being limited and funds being limited. What are some of the successes you've experienced? I mean, one of, some of our successes has just been like, we're growing at a really fast rate now. I think yeah. our first, you know, three to four months, we were pretty slow. I mean, we had some people come to us who were true believers, which we were, which was really great and like kept us buoyed. But it wasn't until we really got traction on search results when we really started to see, you know, it starting to snowball. And in the last three months, our professional community like quadrupled. So okay. we are growing at a rapid rate now. New people are joining us all the time. We're really excited by the quality of professionals that are joining us. Um, there are a lot of skeptics out there who say like, this is just another referral service for lower income clients who are looking for attorneys who probably don't have enough clients and that's why they're there. They're just inexperienced. They need to fill their, you know, client, their client base. 
that is just not true. We knew it wouldn't be the case. We knew other people were going to be attracted to the, being a part of this community and were going to want to broadcast their innovative approach to the law and that they were going to want to meet people in other professional disciplines. And I think a success is that that has borne out to be true. I mean, we really believed in that vision and I really think it has come to life. That's excellent. That's great. So where do you go in the next six months? Are you actively seeking financing right now? We are actively seeking funding, although we are happy to chug along without it for as long as we need, but we are actively seeking financing. We have some investors who are interested in shopping us around and, sure. you know, we'll see where that lands. Um, we are in this, in the fall, we're going to be, you know, I, I did say I'm going to be moving to Boston this mm -hmm. week, actually. This is one of my last two nights. Oh, wow. Before. Yeah. And um, we- Because you, you, you needed to add that to your plate as well. Why not? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I joined the wing in Boston, so I'm going to be working from the wing a couple days a week there. And um, we're going to be doing a panel on premarital advice featuring three of our network members in Boston. Oh, and cool. you know, if that takes off, we're going to take that show on the road. Oh, and um, there's a lot of exciting things in store for us as a company right now. Excellent. That's fantastic. So we're at about the 38 or the 35 minute mark. What haven't we covered that, uh, that you need to share that, that I haven't asked because I'm not, not sure. capable of thinking of it that, uh, that you'd like to share. Maybe what? you want to tell us a little bit about the co-founders because we haven't spent a lot of time on them. Well, I would love to tell you about my co-founders. Okay. And then I have one last point that I want to make. Okay. So my two co-founders, Tali and Sonia, I could talk about them forever. So uh, can we so get I names? About, I talked about Sonia Peralt a little bit earlier. Oh, okay. She's a divorce attorney turned divorce coach. Okay. Um, she herself was got divorced and she and I met when we were both out founding our own practices, her in divorce coaching and me in divorce mediation. Um, Tali Koss is our third co-founder and she was a court attorney who actually left the law to learn to code. And she joined our project because Sonia and I had an inkling of an idea and we had no idea if it could be addressed with tech. We thought it probably could, but we didn't know how. And uh, we found Tali and thank God she had passion for the project because she believes that a well-prepared divorce client is a good person to have in the court, whether or not they have a lawyer. And she thinks that more prepared litigants will make the court system run more smoothly. Okay. So she was very passionate about that aspect of the project. And she, uh, she's our CTO and she, you know, ran our development. She ran all the daily standups. She wireframed our product without her, our company just could not exist. So the three of us really are a great symbiotic team. That's awesome. That's it, it. It all starts at the team level. Uh, you know, if the team can't work together, yep. there's there's going to be problems down the road. Yeah, and you know, we make each other laugh every day, and that's something you really need. In the yeah, I like, bet. I'm so glad I have those two women as my co-founders. That's fantastic. Me. We lift me up every day. So it's the best. That's great. And you said you had one other yeah. point that you so wanted to make. So my last point is that I think something that gets doesn't get talked enough. Uh, talked about enough in tech, which is you need to keep a human in the loop as we advance technology. So, you know, I do think that there is a lot of room for automation in divorce. I think there's a lot of room to empower divorce clients to do more on their own. And I think that the next generation, like the millennial generation, I think they want do it yourself aspects to any problem that they approach. So I certainly think that there is an incredible amount of room for that. And I want to promote more of that. I think that the best technology products have a human aspect built in where there is a human in the loop. So I think like, for example, what Aaron built is really smart because you have the opportunity of checking in for help when you have a stumbling block or you get a problem. You don't have to get all the way to the end, think you're done and then be told you did it wrong. Right? right, like you have someone checking in along the way. So I think for us, that's really important is that human element. Like we vet our, the people in our network. Like we really, like we reach out to the clients. Like this is all something that's very important to us. And so I think that as we advance, the importance, like we as a community want to promote the professionals on our network, not make them obsolete. We right. think that divorce is a, like it's a, it's a, such an emotionally complex problem, you will always need the compassion and wisdom that a human brings to it. And so we really want to promote, like, how do you use professionals efficiently 
and how do you use them at their highest use? Right. And so like we're creating a community that really we want professionals to feel valued in. Um, and so I think that's, that's the final point that I wanted to make. And, and I like that point because I, I want to add to that. I've seen this highest and best use argument for lawyers popping up more in like the last six months. And it, it, it always sticks in my head because it reminds me I did a lot of work in eminent domain uh, in law school. And, and it was always how do you get the highest and best use out of the property? Well, they have to pay for the highest and best use uh, of the property that they're condemning. And I really like that people are using that terminology for the lawyer now. So now the technology is not eliminating the lawyer. It's getting the lawyer to stop doing a bunch of administrative work that is that they're overcharging for if they're charging for it and, and really limiting the knowledge that we acquire in law school and, to and in our practice. To do the part of the practice you actually enjoy. The right thinking, the actual advising, the being creative about how to approach a problem, defending an argument. I mean, these are the things that we went to law school to actually do, right? And let's get some of this document and yeah. form, fill, form filling done without, and without the attorney. Courts, I wish the family courts would go to e-filing, but I know, you know that's a rarity in family court, and I think it's going to be a long time before we get there. So like, let's do what we can on our own to make work within the system we have and make it more efficient. Yeah. uh, And I, and I think, uh, I think that's great that you see the human element as important. Uh, There's a, there's a term in, in robotics that, that I think was coined in Amazon, which is called, maybe it wasn't coined by them, but it's used by them regularly or cobots, collaborative bots that they're using in their warehouses to help the people who are working in the warehouses work more efficiently. So they're working together with the bot. That's all we're trying to use technology for at this point. I'm sure somebody out there wants to replace us, but, but the majority of what I'm seeing done in legal technology is. Also, clients want legal help. They just think they can't afford it. Right. Right. So let's make it more affordable and accessible. And accessible. And by not publishing rates, you really hurt yourself because people think if you have to ask the price, it's too high. Right. Yeah. And so make it out, put it out there, make it transparent. Let me know what I'm getting into so I can make a decision. And if I've got to save up some money or plan for it a little differently and make some cuts, I know that in advance. Mm -hmm. So, well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Casey, for joining us. Uh, Tell us how we get in touch with you and with your company. So my email is Casey at Divorcify.com. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at, at Divorcify. Um, it does have the E in it. So Divorce I-F-Y, that's important. And uh, we're also on LinkedIn at that handle as well. I'm on LinkedIn, Casey Rochevin, and on Twitter, Casey Shevin JD. All right. So you've heard it. This has been episode 55 of Legal Tech Live. I'm Nick Richwain. Our guest tonight was Casey Rose Shevin of Divorcify, divorcify divorcify.com. And you can email her at Casey at divorcify.com. Remember, there's the E before the I-F-Y. Keep that in mind and reach out to her and learn all about divorce, GPS, and all that they offer at divorceify.com. Casey, thank you so much once again, and don't disappear after we stop recording. Okay, won't. And thank you, everybody. This will be our end of summer recording. Uh, we'll be off for a few weeks. We will be back January 8th, or July 18th with Maya Markovich of Next Law Labs. We'll see you soon.